Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this web stream this afternoon. Uh, my name is Deborah Pugh. I'm the Executive Director of ACT Autism Community Training. And today we're going to hear a presentation by Dr. Brenda Fawcett. Um, it was a presentation we'd hoped to have last week, but um, due to a uh, unforeseen uh, car accident that took out the power supply from her home office, we ended up uh, having that somewhat truncated. So we did hear from Dr. Richard Stock, uh, a colleague of Brenda's at Capilano University. And so he's already done his part. And the good news is this has allowed Brenda to do um, a full hour today, uh, which if if any of you know Dr. Fawcett's work, um, she usually crams about two or three hours into a regular one hour slot. So there'll be a bit more breathing room for us. Um, you'll find that her materials and her analysis are very rich, as well as her compassion for families and children. Just to remind you, today's presentation is coping with behavior challenges during COVID-19, setting realistic uh, expectations for families. And I think this is a really important uh, topic uh, for us to discuss and it's really been a theme through all of the presentations that ACT has done uh, since COVID-19 began, which is to try and encourage families not to put too much on their shoulders um, given the challenges that some of them face um, with the needs of their children and all the other pressures that every family is, is um, experiencing. Um, I also want to point out to you that Dr. Fawcett has some full-length videos on the ACT's uh, website on um, uh, autism videos at ACT, which is a free service that ACT maintains. We have 60 videos available and several days of Dr. Fawcett. And so if you were hoping that you'll get tempted to spend some more time with Brenda during this quiet period, uh, because you'll find her work extremely helpful uh, for those of us, and I include myself in this, who have children who whose language is quite limited and really benefit from a lot of um, visual supports. So um, I'd like to, without further ado, turn this over to uh, Dr. Brenda Fawcett. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks again for providing me the opportunity to come back and my apologies for last week. Um, and thank you to your team for um, supporting and helping out with all of these sessions that you've been doing over the past several weeks. So I'm just um, setting up my slides for you and so we should be good to go now. Uh, and as Deborah said, uh, Dr. Richard Stock, my colleague at Capilano University, uh, took some time last week to speak to um, expectations for families and you know what families should realistically expect of themselves at this time. Um, and remembering that you know nobody sort of has planned for this. Uh, these are unprecedented circumstances. Um, your children. Uh, are finding things quite changed in their lives as you are also finding things quite changed in your lives. And he spoke a lot to the need to really um, take care of yourselves and take care of your children and sort of do what uh, is going to work best for you and to, to sort of have realistic and humane expectations for yourselves. What I'm going to be talking about today are some tools that you might be able to use to help you support uh, your children um, as this situation continues and likely beyond, um, you know, even as things start to open up and we sort of start to move into what's being called our new normal, uh, some things are likely going to stay somewhat different for a while. And uh, many of the children uh, that you live with, and men, I know many of the children that I support, are going to need some ongoing assistance to sort of understand what it is that's going on around them and how to cope with that. So that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, this afternoon. And I've got a number of resources and links to resources that are included in the handouts that will be posted on um, the ACT webpage and on Facebook as well. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about today uh, has to do with strategies to help your child understand what the deal is with COVID-19 and what is it that everybody's sort of talking about and what it is that has their schools closed, 
um, and their favorite places in the communities closed and why it is they can't uh, do the sorts of things that they regularly do. And so the first thing that I wanted to spend some time talking about uh, is around the use of social narratives. And many of you um, are probably familiar with the term social story. Brenda, could you yes. uh, make your slides full screen? I can do that, absolutely. How's that? That work? Okay, I think that works. So social narratives, um, are a way of providing information. And as I was saying, you're probably familiar with social stories um, and social stories being a strategy that was developed by Carol Gray. Um, social stories is one kind of social narrative um, and social stories is uh, a strategy where stories are written in a very specific format. Social narratives is a term that sort of envelops social stories. It's a bit more of a generic approach. So social narratives may or may not follow uh, Carol Gray's format exactly. But the idea around social narratives is to provide information uh, to individuals in a way that they will easily understand and to help them understand what's going on. So, you know, when we think about this in relation to COVID-19 and the current circumstances, it's something that's very difficult for many adults to understand, many typically developing adults. Most of us have never experienced anything like this before. It's anxiety provoking, it's stressful, it's unusual, it's different. Um, and we're trying to understand that. When you think about an individual, a child in particular with ASD or other developmental disabilities who might have um, some challenges around uh, understanding information, some challenges around language, we might need to think about ways to provide that information um, in a way that is more accessible to them. And so that's really the idea behind social narratives is to do that. So we want to provide some contextual information to help them understand what's going on. And in doing so, what we sometimes see is a reduction in some of the problematic behaviors that might occur because children don't understand what's going on. And if you think about your own life, um, perhaps as even a typically developing adult, sometimes when you're in an unfamiliar or stressful situation, you might not behave in the lovely way and the friendly way that you typically do. You might be a little um, snarky to other people because things aren't expected. Um, and so providing information or gaining information might change your behavior if you have some context. And so the idea with children is the same thing, to provide them with some of that context. And if they have a better understanding about what's happening and why, it might also reduce some of those problematic behaviors or increase some of the desirable behaviors that we might like to see. Things like hand washing, for example. So since uh, the COVID-19 situation sort of hit, uh, numerous people have been developing social narratives and social stories and making them freely available to, to families, to special educators and other individuals. And Carol Gray herself has written um, a number of these stories and she's also collected some of these stories and sort of curated them together. Um, What's important to know is that sometimes the language of these stories, if you go online and access some of them, you might find that the language is too advanced for your child. And I wanted to show you an example of a social story at a higher language level that may or may not be appropriate for your own child. So this is um, a story written by Carol Gray, and you can see if we look at the slide, this is the first page, and it says this is, this this story is about pandemics and the coronavirus. A pandemic is when many people in a large area become sick. A pandemic is usually caused by a new virus. So while the language is clear and specific, if your child has quite limited language skills, they may not understand that information. This story goes on to talk more about the coronavirus and viruses in general and what viruses are. So you can see that, you know, on this slide, they're talking about an electron microscope and how you need that kind of a microscope to be able to see viruses. And then it goes on to talk about um, hand washing and how important hand washing is. So you can see that some social stories or social narratives have a much higher level of language. 
So you need to use a bit of judgment based on your knowledge of your child's level of language and understanding of language to decide whether or not a story like this is really going to provide them with the kind of information they need. So sometimes what I might do is sort of look at these stories to get some ideas and then I might simplify the language even further if I'm working with somebody who has a much more limited uh, understanding of language. There are also a no number of other stories that have been developed uh, by a variety of people, um, many of them using picture communication symbols from Boardmaker or other kinds of communication symbol sets. Um, and these are often written in a, a clearer format, more simple language, um, might be more appropriate for some learners who have more limited language comprehension skills or understanding of language in general. So this is um, a coronavirus story uh, from Easter Seals Illinois Autism Partnership. And just to give you some comparison, here's a couple of pages from this story. So as you can see, very clear graphics and images, and a very short, simple, clear, direct sentence. Sometimes people get sick. When someone gets sick, it's because of germs. Germs are tiny things that live all around us. If a bad germ sticks on me, I can get sick. I need to wash my hands a lot so that I can stay healthy. Okay, so you can see that the language in that story is much more clear and direct, and the graphics are very much connected to the information. So when you're looking for social narratives, if you want to use social narratives that others have written, what you want to make sure that you're doing is paying attention to the graphic images and the language in those stories to make sure that it's a good match for your child in terms of your child's understanding. Sometimes I'll find a story that has great graphics, but the language isn't quite right. I might sort of use the graphics and just rewrite the story. Sometimes I just use the stories as they're written. And sometimes I'll take the story, I'll read it, and I'll change it quite a lot. I'll use the, the story that I find as sort of an idea starter, and I'll make my own. So I have provided, and you'll, you'll be able to access in your handouts, a number of links where you can download um, freely available social narratives and social stories that have been written uh, specifically for individuals with autism spectrum disorder or other developmental disabilities, um, addressing a variety of issues related to COVID-19. So some of these stories talk about what is a coronavirus, what is COVID-19, uh, some of these stories talk about why are schools closed or how do I wash my hands? Why do I need to wash my hands? Um, there are stories about wearing masks and why is it that people need to wear masks and um, what if I need to wear a mask and why do I need to wear a mask? So there are a variety of stories that have been written um, that you can take a look at and download and use with your own child to help them understand some of the things that are going on and give them some of that information that they might otherwise not be accessing from their general environment, okay? There are also some video-based social narratives, and this one in particular um, is quite nice. It was developed uh, by folks at the University of Miami, Nova, uh, Nova Southeastern University. And it's a video-based social narrative that, again, gives some general information about COVID-19. We're not going to watch it today because you can go ahead and take a look at that yourself. Um, but it is, again, freely available on YouTube. And it's one of those um, videos where there's the drawing hand and it sort of explains things as you go along. So it's, again, relatively simple, relatively clear and direct um, with some nice clear graphics. And so if you have an individual who is perhaps more interested in watching video than looking at a book, this might be something worth um, using for your child. So when you select, find, write social stories, um, you wanna make sure that you're using them in a way that enhances your child's understanding of whatever it is you're trying to inform them about. And so the first step is really getting a social narrative that's going to be appropriate for your child. So first you either wanna select one that's been written already or create one yourself. So think about the information that you want to convey um, 
that's absolutely necessary. So you want to make sure that you're highlighting the important information and sort of not including the irrelevant details. You want to make sure that the important details are included. You want to make sure that you're using language that's going to be appropriate for the individual. And so sometimes I've written social stories or social narratives where, you know, they're two word sentences um, as opposed to a full sentence. So it might be people sick, wash hands, very simple kinds of things. If you've got a, a child who understands language at a much higher level, then you can provide them with more detail. Okay. Um, in your stories, you want to use a tone that's calm and reassuring, right? So you don't want your stories to make um, children or individuals feel more anxious or more panicked uh, about what's going on. You don't want to make them more confused. The idea um, is to give them information in a calm way uh, to let them know that things are going to be okay, um, that sort of the adults are taking care of things. Um, as best they can. You, you want to give them accurate information um, and be be sort of reassuring, right? Th this is going to all work out. And I know that for lots of adults, perhaps we don't always feel like this is going to, to work out well in the end. Um, and we need to sort of remind ourselves that this is temporary. Um, you know, we don't know what's going to happen exactly. But here, you know, I do know what's going to happen for the next few weeks. And let me sort of lay some information out for you in a calm way. The other thing you want to make sure to do is use images or illustrations that convey or portray that information in a clear manner uh, for your child. So again, lots of the stories that are available online have some nice clear images, but sometimes, um, you know, even when I'm making my own, good old fashioned stick figure drawings work just fine. So, you know, if you don't have access to software and you're writing your own story, you can go ahead and draw your own images and they don't need to be, you know, artistic level, um, so long as they're sort of clear and direct and to the point and your child understands them. Okay, so you want to make sure that you've got a good story to work with. And then the next thing you want to do is read that story with your child. So this shouldn't be a long session, usually a few minutes. Um, again, if you think about uh, oftentimes we're trying to talk about information that's new or difficult or maybe a bit anxiety provoking. So we don't want to prolong that too much. Um, so sessions of a few minutes at a time when your child's already calm and relaxed. So this isn't something to do when your child is really upset because they can't go to the park um, because they're not allowed to, or they can't go to school, or they can't have their friend over. Um, that's not the time when they're upset to bring the story in and have them look at a story. You want to do this sort of before the problem happens at a time when they're nice and calm. Ideally, you want to read these at least once a day so that they're getting that information sort of in a repetitive manner. Um, lots of times children will want to read the story again and again, and that's fine. If your child wants to go back and look at the social story or the social narrative again, certainly. Um, many individuals um, who are trying to sort of acquire new information or learn something new, they want to sort of revisit that. I think that goes, you know, whether you have autism or a developmental disability or not, um, when you're learning something new or when something is a bit stressful or anxiety provoking, being able to return to that information that sort of clarifies things for you can be calming. And so certainly allow them to go back and revisit the story many times a day if they wish. Um, the other thing to remember is that the point of social narratives is to provide information. So sometimes people write what they think is a social narrative or a social story and make it a list of don'ts or a list of do's. Don't do this. You, you can't go to school. You can't play with your friends. You can't go to the park. You can't do this. You must stay at home. You have to be quiet. That's not a very reassuring kind of story. Um, and it doesn't really give any information. That's a list of rules. Now, certainly providing some rules, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But our, our point here with social narratives is to try and give individuals some information so that they can better understand what's happening to them 
and what's happening around them and why mom and dad are staying home all day when usually they're at work and why they're not at school and you know why are things so different okay so if you're thinking about social narratives and the kinds of topics that you might address you might write a story or download a story that just explains why school is closed. Or if your child is about to return to school, as some schools are starting to open for some individuals for part of the time, um, you might write a story about why there are so few children at school or why they're only going to school for a short period of time and not all day, right? You might be writing a story about why stores are closed, right? So lots of individuals, have routines that they enjoy or places that they enjoy and you know they like to go to the toy store they like to go to the bookstore or costco or whatever and now they can't um and they don't understand why and they can certainly see you know that somebody's going to the store because food is coming into the house um well why can't i go okay um you might write a story about why they can't do a particular activity or go to the swimming pool or other kinds of places in the community that they like, why they can't visit with their preferred people, um, why people can't come to their house. If you're usually having behavior interventionists or a behavior consultant or an SLP or other professionals coming into your house to spend time and work with your child, uh, they might need a social narrative about why this isn't happening anymore. Why do they have to see this person on the computer through video conferencing rather than that person coming to their house? So you might write a social narrative about that. Um, you might write social narratives about washing hands and why it's so important um, and why they have to count to 20 or sing happy birthday while they do it. You might have a story about social or physical distancing and why it is, you know, if they are going outside, why they have to stay a certain distance away from other people. So there are lots of different topics that you might write social narratives about. Choosing what topics will be based on the information that you think is most relevant to your child and what your child seems to need information about to help him or her understand what's going on better. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to talk about was this issue of predictability and structure and routine, um, which has really changed for pretty much everyone these days. So many of us are finding now that we don't have a lot of predictability. We don't know um, when this is going to be over, uh, when we can get back to the kinds of things that we usually do from one day to the next. Um, we might be working at home, but without our usual kind of structure and routine in place. And that it's a bit difficult to sort of figure out how is my day structured now. Um, I'm sure many people are finding, you know, they're in their pajamas a little bit later in the morning. They're watching a little more TV or Netflix. Their, their structure and routine is just a little bit off. It's not kind of business as usual. And so we all need predictability. And I think probably one of the most difficult things um, about this whole situation is the lack of predictability and that, you know, all of us are sort of left wondering what's going on, um, when are things going to be the way they're supposed to be. And, you know, even for us, when things are unpredictable, lots of people will feel anxious, upset, angry, all sorts of things. And you're probably well aware, um, if not for yourself, you've heard about, um, you know, sort of an increase in mental health issues over the past several weeks because there is this lack of predictability and there are lots of changes and there's a lot of uncertainty and it's difficult for everyone to deal with that. So if you think about that as something that's difficult for us as typically developing adults, um, certainly for individuals with autism, for kids, typically developing kids, um, but certainly kids with autism and uh, other developmental disabilities, if they struggle with predictability when life is sort of normal, they're certainly going to be um, struggling with this now. So for lots of our kids, regular life isn't predictable enough. And a lot of the work that I do when I'm working with families has to do with, you know, making day-to-day -day life a bit more predictable and structured and routine for them so that they understand what's going on. And that's when things are kind of normal. 
So COVID-19 life is sort of a predictability nightmare. There really isn't much that's predictable. Um, and so it's going to be even more sort of upsetting or anxiety provoking for lots of individuals. So the first thing that I suggest to all families, um, even in regular times, but certainly now, is creating some daily structure and routine and to have a daily schedule. So that doesn't necessarily mean that you're programming um, learning activities every waking moment or therapy activities every waking moment, but that you've got some clear structure and routine to your day. Um, and sometimes that is structuring free time, having unstructured playtime in the schedule, um, but really thinking about just your regular activities and making a schedule so that individuals know what to expect during the day. So things like daily hygiene tasks, scheduling those in. So tooth brushing, hair brushing, face washing, those kinds of things. Structuring in meals. Um, when are we having breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, that kind of thing. Uh, structuring in any kind of chore. It might be really simple things like putting away toys. It could be helping to make your bed. It could be helping to set the table, anything that your child might be able to participate in. Uh, exercise time. So thinking about scheduling in exercise. That might be something that happens in your home. So you might do some home-based physical activities. Um, and there are lots of things online now available um, that you can use, or you can make up your own activities. So you can um, do jumping jacks, and you can run in place, and you can do different things like that in your own home. Um, or you could go for a walk if that's something that you're able to do, or do other kinds of activities if you have some outside space. Certainly structure in play. Um, time when you're playing with your child or your child might be playing with siblings. And then again, like I said, make sure that you schedule in that sort of free unstructured time where your child can go off and do what he or she chooses. And it's also a bit of time for you to have a break. Um, I suspect that, you know, as the days go by, uh, it's getting increasingly difficult for most families to sort of manage getting through the day doing their regular activities and trying to also keep their kids occupied, right? The days are very long. I can't imagine what it would be like. I don't have children. I'm just trying to keep my own life scheduled, never mind someone else's life scheduled. I can't imagine the challenges um, that families are facing trying to sort of keep things happening during the day. And certainly you're going to need some time during the day to have a bit of a break. So, you know, if your child wants to watch the screen and that means that you have time for a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or a glass of wine or whatever it is you're going to have, um, certainly embed that into your schedule. Um, but create a schedule so that your child knows what to expect and what's going to happen. If you decide that you'd like to do academic tasks or you are doing academic tasks, um, whether that be something that you're doing on your own or with your home team or with your school team, Schedule times that are short and manageable. So, you know, I know Richard talked about this last week. You're not trying to replicate school at home. You can't replicate school at home. Um, you shouldn't be expected to try to replicate school at home. And so you're not going to go, okay, well, from 9 to 12, we're doing schoolwork because that's what would happen at school. You can't do that. So maybe you're doing 15 or 20 minutes, maybe a half an hour of a learning activity, and then you're going to take a break and do something else. Okay. But whatever it is you decide to do, provide some structure in a way that your child's going to understand. So if your child reads, great, you can provide a written schedule. If your child doesn't read, you can use pictures. Um, and there are some links that I'll be providing at the end, and they'll be in your handouts of places where you can access pictures um, to use. Again, good old stick figures work just as well. So I've worked with lots of families where kind of off the cuff, last minute, they don't have access to, to software. They just draw some things out on a piece of paper. Here's what we're doing for second, third. And that also works just fine. What I recommend is that you take the time at the beginning of the day to set up that schedule and review it with your child. So 
you know, rather than make the scheduling kind of wave it near your child, sit down with your child and say, okay, first we're going to do this, then we're going to do that, then we're going to do the next thing. Um, so that they're involved in seeing how that daily plan is going to roll out. As much as you can, give your child opportunities to make some choices. So if you have a few chores that need to be done and you're going to do those chores between 10 and 11, um, give them the option. Do they want to start with the dusting or the laundry, right? And they can work alongside and help you. Um, if it's free play time, give them a choice of what the play activity might be. If it's snack time, give them a choice of what they're having for snacks. So give choices as much as possible. That'll also help your child feel a bit more in control uh, of a situation that's kind of out of their control. Um, if sort of getting things done is sometimes a problem. So getting your child to do activities that are perhaps less preferred, if that's a struggle sometimes, then what you should do is schedule something that's very, very highly preferred right afterwards and show them on the schedule, right? So first you have to brush your teeth and then you get to play with your favorite toy, okay? So that first then idea to increase motivation. Um, have a way that you'll signify to them when it's time to move from one activity to the next. And that could be just very simply your kitchen timer or the timer on your iPhone. And when they hear it ding, it's time to go back and check the schedule and see what's next. Um, also think about a way for them to indicate that they've completed activities. So it could be check boxes if you're doing sort of a written schedule, if you're using pictures that are either taped or Velcroed, you could remove those or turn them over or do something like that so that they have a clear way of showing um, and seeing where they're at in their visual schedule in terms of moving through their day. So here's an example of what a daily schedule could look like. And this is one that was just made on Microsoft Word using Microsoft Word icons. So again, it doesn't have to be um, fancy and expensive special software. Uh, you can use what you have, okay? And this is one where you, know, you would print it out and there's a little box for checking things off when they're completed. Um, the other issue about predictability has to do with more than just what's happening today, but what's happening across weeks. And this is extra challenging right now because we don't exactly know what's going to happen across weeks and months. We don't know um, if or when school will open before the end of the school year. We don't know um, when restrictions might be lifted. We don't know when for a lot of stuff. And I know that Dr. Stock talked a bit about that last week. But you can also use um, a weekly or monthly calendar to perhaps provide information about maybe some more special events. So I have a family um, and they're trying to go for sort of car rides, longer car rides once or twice a week um, as a way of kind of keeping their child uh, amused, interested in something, occupied. And it sort of gives the parents a break too because he's buckled in to his car seat in the back seat and then the parents can drive, they turn on some music and, and their kid's sort of contained and he's happy in the back seat looking out the window and, and there we go. Um, and so what they're doing is using a weekly calendar and putting pictures of car on that weekly calendar so that he can see which days are gonna be car ride days. Um, you might use a monthly or a weekly calendar to show when you might be going out for walks or for hikes. Um, if your child is doing Zoom sessions with a BI or an SEA from school, you could also put that information on a weekly or monthly calendar um, or any special activities you might be doing at home. So lots of people are doing more baking these days because again, we're trying to look for things to do. Um, and your child, once they get a taste of baking, might wanna bake every day. We, you know, we're making cookies every day, we're gonna have a problem. So maybe once a week we're making cookies so we can put on our calendar which day is bake cookie day so that you know we don't have our kid coming at us every day. Let's make cookies, let's make cookies. We can refer them back to the calendar and you know, no, no, it's not happening today. It's gonna happen on Friday, Friday's cookie making day, okay? So use a weekly uh, or a monthly calendar to provide that kind of information and use that with your child. So at the end of each day, cross off, X off, um, the day and then check to see, is there something planned for tomorrow? 
Um, if your child makes a request that's a doable request, like they want to go for a hike or a car ride or bake cookies, um, and they've asked today and we can't do it today, you could say, okay, well, not today, but let's go put it on the calendar. Here's when you can have that. So if it's a reasonable request, a request that you can grant, put that down. Um, you know, if the request is, can I go back to school or can I go play with a friend? We don't know when that's going to happen yet. So then you might put, you know, at the end of the month, question mark. We'll see if we can schedule it at the end of the month. Okay. Um, so like I said, I, I feel for, for parents who are at home with their children um, trying to fill the time because the days are long, um, especially if you are quite limited in terms of the places where you can go. Um, I know that there are families out there who can't safely go out of their home um, because of their child's behavior. And so that makes it even more challenging. So while some families might be able to go for a walk or go for a car ride, other families really are sort of stuck within the confines of their home um, because that's the safest place to be. And those days then are very long. So you need to sort of be thinking about ways to keep your child engaged and occupied um, as a way to sort of reduce problem behavior because if they start getting bored, um, they're likely to go looking for things to engage themselves in. And lots of times it's problematic stuff that they're doing. So really try to think about um, ways you can involve your child in things that you need to do already. Um, and so I know that that in some of the previous sessions, I'm sure this has been discussed. Um, I know that on, on lots of discussion forums, this has been discussed, but now is a really great time for all children, but especially for children with autism and other developmental disabilities to really be working on some of those daily living skills that they're going to need for the rest of their lives. So while they may not be old enough to cook independently, or it may not be safe for them to cook independently, they could participate in some of those cooking related activities. Maybe it's about them gathering items while you're cooking. And that's a great opportunity for you to work on communication skills, right? So where you give an instruction, go get the milk or go get a spoon and they have to listen and get those items. Maybe their job is to set the table. Maybe they're helping to pour or stir or do some of those other things. So they're sort of working alongside of you. Does this take a little bit more time? Certainly, um, but lots of us have a bit more time these days too. And so again, it's about sort of filling the time. So if it takes longer to make dinner, but your kid is now engaged for an hour, you've knocked an hour off the day in terms of trying to keep your child occupied. Think about including them in after meal cleanup, whether that's putting dishes in the sink or in the dishwasher, helping to put leftovers in the fridge, those kinds of things. Um, laundry. They could help with things like sorting the clothes or putting the clothes into the washer or dryer, sorting folding socks if they're able to, um, fold other clothes, put clothes away, um, various kinds of cleaning activities. So it could be as simple as picking up their own toys, but they could help with dusting or wiping the table or things like that. Um, and if you have outdoor space, they could be helping to sort of sweep up the leaves or water plants or, or things like that. So really sort of think about, you know, what are some things you could do around the house that need to be done anyway, and how you might involve your child in doing that. And it's kind of a, a two birds with one stone thing. So you're getting some tasks done that you need to get done anyway, and you're keeping your child occupied. And then the extra bonus is your child's learning how to do many of those tasks, which is something that they should learn how to do anyway. And then again, please remember to take some time to take a break for yourself. Um, you will need regular breaks. Um, it is difficult to engage your child all day, every day, especially if you can't really go outside a lot of places. So you need breaks and your child needs breaks. And I know that people are extra concerned about lots of screen time right now. And honestly, you know, it's okay. Let them have a little extra, extra screen time. If you can make it educational screen time, great. But if you're feeling that you need a break, that you're kind of, you know, reaching your limits, let them have 
extra screen time so that you have some time to rest and recuperate and rejuvenate and be ready to kind of get back in there. Um, your children need you. And so you need to take care of yourself so that you can do what you need to do for your child. That's really important. The other thing you can think about doing is certainly making it fun. Um, not lots of people think chores are fun, but um, you can add a little fun into it. So this is an example of a chores bingo board. And you can put in chores that need to be done around your house. And every time your child does something, they get to mark off a square. And you can either play it as one row bingo or fill the board bingo or however you want to play it. But they could get a prize at the end, right? And you could have chores bingo. You could have schoolwork bingo. You could have eating your fruits and vegetables bingo. You could make bingo boards for all kinds of things. Um, and that might be a way to encourage participation, right? So they get a prize or they get a special um, privilege or activity when they get a bingo. And that might encourage them to participate in more activities. Certainly, it makes it fun. So like I kind of said already, um, the idea of learning, um, this is going to happen whether or not kids are in school. And this really is a good time to think about how children can be learning things um, that are really necessary for them throughout the course of their lifespan. So all throughout the day, there are going to be lots of opportunities for your children to learn even without working on academics. So you could put all academics, everything sort of school academic related aside, and your child can still be busy learning all day, every day. So they can be working on things like independence and improving their independence in things like hygiene and daily living tasks, but also in independent play, which is a really important thing. It's an important thing for parents right now, I know, um, to have their child be able to be engaged in a leisure activity independently, which means that parents get some independent time to either do tasks that they need to do or just sit back and relax. We can be working on communication all day long. So things like making choices and following directions. Um, we can be working on motor skills, again, all day long. During exercise activities, we can certainly be working on some of those more gross motor things. But during hygiene and daily living and play tasks, all of those fine motor skills we can work on as well. And then certainly executive functioning skills or those sort of bigger organizational skills. Using and following a daily schedule is a really important thing for all of us. Um, as we go into adulthood and we have to work and we have to manage our home and all of those kinds of things, that means sort of organizing and following a daily, weekly and monthly schedule. And so this is a good time to start practicing those skills in the home. So my big message is really to do what you can um, and certainly go easy on yourself. You can't do school at home. Um, you shouldn't be expected to do school at home. So you want to go easy on yourself and do what's reasonable for you. And what's reasonable for you might be different from what's reasonable for another parent. And that's totally OK. You also want to go easy on your child and remember that this is all very strange for them as well. Right. So the idea and the thing that I keep saying to lots of my families, the goal here is calm and happy. Let's just keep everybody calm and happy and get our way through this. Um, like Dr. Stock said last week, you didn't sign up for this. Nobody signed up for this. Your child certainly didn't sign up for this. You didn't sign up for this. Um, we want to be thinking about humane options. So if we have you know, a variety of things that we could choose to do, we want to choose the thing that's the most humane um, for all of us. Home is different from school, and you're not going to be able to replicate school in your home. Um, and so you want to be flexible about that. And, you know, what one day Monday might look different from Tuesday might like look different from Wednesday. And, and it's OK to be flexible right now and sort of um, do what you need to do to keep everyone, including yourself, calm and happy. So I do have a number of resources to help you. And I really hope that um, you're able to get online and access a lot of these things. There are um, many things that people have been putting together and making widely available to families. The first uh, link that I have for you um, is a resource called Supporting Individuals with Autism Through Uncertain Times. Um, there are links to resources to online activities that you can do with your child or that your child can do. Uh, 
the New Brunswick Department of Education and Early Childhood Development has created a very nice guide for families of children with autism and other neurodevelopmental challenges. Um, and they've got some really nice resources, particularly around structure, routine, and visual schedules. And so that link is there for you as well. The Ohio Center for Autism and Low uh, Incidence has a number of social narratives ready for you, and many of them are written at a lower language level, and they're very clear and, and specific and direct. They also have a general resource gallery of interventions um, from visual schedules and visual timers and um, behavior support, so a wide variety of things that you might find useful uh, when supporting your child. And the University of Houston College of Education has also collected a number of resources for families, um, including some really nice ideas around indoor activities and how to keep your, your child kind of um, engaged in some indoor appropriate physical activities and also how to prevent challenging behavior and how parents can really focus on taking care of themselves while they're trying to support their children at home. Um, there are also some free resources, uh, particularly in terms of symbols. Uh, the News to You is a, a company that provides a variety of educational um, resources and programming. They're providing free access to everything that they have. Um, so they're learning and their symbol solutions. So they've got a very large symbol library that you can use to make all kinds of visual supports, including schedules. Um, and so you can go there and they also have links to some social narratives and other kinds of communication supports that have already been made. Um, Board Maker, if you're familiar with the Board Maker software that makes communication symbols, uh, that company has provided a number of free learning activities and resources um, that are available. And then just this morning, so this link isn't in your handouts now, but I will make sure that it gets to you. Um, I found a link this morning for a curated uh, collection of COVID-19 related resources, um, including visual supports and social narratives, uh, as well as educational and, and learning materials. Uh, I believe there are about 150 resources um, in this curated list. And so I've included the link for that as well. So I'm hoping that this session this afternoon has given you some um, ideas of things that you can do that um, will help keep you relatively calm and happy at home, that will help your child understand um, what it is that's going on and, um, and help reduce their anxiety a little bit and some ways that you can help keep your child occupied until such a time that things start to return a, a bit more to, to normal. So I thank you for, for taking the time this afternoon. Okay. So Brenda, thank you. I just had one thing to add to your wonderful presentation. Um, and that is, you know, while a lot of parents are really focused on academics for their children and are very nervous about school being closed, that uh, the research looking at the children who do best as they become adults who manage to achieve as much independence as possible, um, it's pretty clear that those who have participated at home and unloading the dishwasher and doing everyday activities actually do better in terms of finding a job than those who have never lifted a finger at home and, but you know, academically Correct. they're doing really well. So maybe, could you speak to that just a bit? That's essentially the message. Um, the research has been quite clear in showing that, that children who do partake in those daily activities, um, children who are more independent in daily self-care tasks, so they're able to shower independently, they can take care of their hygiene needs, um, they're able to manage even simple meals, they can manage their time, they can follow a schedule, um, that those are the bigger indicators of success in adulthood and particularly um, acquiring and keeping employment. Um, so the individuals who have really good academic skills but haven't done those things, those individuals are often finding it more challenging to find employment. And if they do find employment, they often are not keeping that employment. I just found that when I saw that research some years ago, so fascinating. Um, 
So one of the things also that I wanted to point out to parents is that a presentation that we did a couple of weeks ago with Dr. Pat Miranda and uh, Dr. Paolo Coloso um, about you know looking at very early intervention uh, for children even prior to a diagnosis has some great resources on um, not necessarily um, academic resource, because this is for very young children, but uh, there were a lot of links to, um, you know, things like Sesame Street that would be enjoyable, was somewhat educational, uh, was fun, and you didn't feel that your child was completely, um, uh, you know, glued to the screen for no value. So um, we'll post the link to that um, presentation and to those uh, and the links to, to those educational materials. The other thing um, I just wanted to, to raise was our most popular online video is, you know, toilet training, it's never too late. Uh, also with Dr. Um, Pat Miranda. And this summer for families who, who haven't manage to tackle that is a great time if you're going to be home all the time with your child and they haven't been toilet trained to watch that video and to get a sense of some of the practicalities because if by the end of the summer if that's been a problem for your for your child if by the end of the summer that's that's been solved that's a tremendous you know a tremendous step forward to inclusion because it's pretty hard to be included in community when you're when you're not toilet trained and you're over three or four years old. So that was something else I wanted to mention. Absolutely, and you know those of you who might be working with um, behavior consultants or other professionals, they might also be able to provide some support around toilet training, even virtually, in terms of some parent coaching. It's a relatively um, relatively easy thing to provide online parent coaching for in terms of toilet training and it's one of the greatest gifts that you can give not only yourself but your child yeah it's really important and there's lots of videos that we have uh, on on Ava that gives those practical you know sleep uh, sleeping toilet training are, are very important um, one of the questions that we had from a uh, Speaking of practicalities, there's one question I, I have for you from our audience is, and very relevant to COVID-19 is, with all these new social distancing and more and more reliance is being placed on wearing face masks, how do you help a child um, learn how to use a face mask, given all the sensory issues our, our children often um, show? What would your suggestions be? Right. So um, I think many of us right now are sort of thinking about how we're going to approach this. Certainly providing information as to why um, can be helpful. So first of all, helping children understand why it is that they're being asked to do such an seemingly odd thing. Um, yes something that they're they're really not accustomed to. Um, and then in terms of actual wearing, um, if your child is at all resistant, uh, you might start by modeling, putting on and taking off um, a face mask, and then gradually working. So, you know, the formal term we would call is systematic desensitization. Um, that's the fancy word for it, but essentially um, taking really small steps. You might start by letting your child just pick up the face mask and then maybe bring the face mask to their face, but not actually put the string around their ears. Um, and then work towards getting a string around one ear and then maybe around both ears and literally having it on for a second, three seconds, five seconds, and so on and so forth. And giving them some sort of reinforcement afterwards, a reward uh, for doing so. So put your face mask on for a second and you can have your iPad and play a game, put your face mask on for three seconds or five seconds, and then you can have your favorite thing. And gradually increasing the time um, would be the way most of us would probably approach a child who's resistant. Um, some children may not be resistant. Some children may, you know, if you, if they see other people in their home wearing them, they might be just fine. The other thing to think about is the style of mask. So if having something behind their ears is troublesome, 
can you get a mask that goes around their head instead? Um, you know, maybe they won't wear a regular mask, but you know, those sort of hairband type things that have sort of the neck to them where they can wear it around their neck and pull it up over their nose, that might be acceptable. Um, and so sort of getting creative and, and thinking about, you know, what's, what's going to be reasonable for your child and gradually working your way up to doing so. Thank you, Brenda. I think that's a very good way forward. Uh, so I'd like to thank Dr. Fawcett for her presentation today. And I'd also rec like to recognize CIRCA, the Center for Interdisciplinary Research uh, and Collaboration in Autism at the University of British Columbia, who's helped uh, fund the series that we're having. And I'd like to thank also all of the people who over the last few weeks have help, helped act um, meet some of the many uh, demands from families uh, for practical information. We're always interested in hearing from you. You can email us at info at actcommunity.ca and we highly recommend you go to our website and look under the COVID-19 resources. Uh, there's a lot of information there. We keep trying to reorganize it to make it clear. So uh, we recognize that um, there's a lot of meaty stuff there and Brenda has added that to that today. So thank you, Dr. Fawcett. Thank you, Dr. Stock. And um, for those of you who are um, perhaps uh, looking forward to the long weekend, even if you're spending it at home, um, have a really nice time and enjoy yourselves, enjoy your children and, as we said, realistic expectations. We can get through this if we try and be kind to each other. Goodbye, everybody. And thank you. Thank you.